morning, Christ Church, and welcome. Let's stand to our feet. As we come before our God, we bring him all praise and glory and honor. That is due to his name, for he is our creator. He is our savior and sustainer. So we rejoice in the great things that our God has done. We sing this. Come, let us worship our King. And come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. Yes, he has. And see what our Savior has done. And see how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things.
so true. We as humans have forever been looking for a king, someone or something to serve, but there is no king like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. Uh, if we haven't had the privilege of meeting, my name is Sean Carney and I serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Church and uh, I'm so glad to be worshiping with you today. Uh, church family, you know now's the time to jump on the, the Christ Church app, go to the dashboard, fill out the communication card, and let us know that you're here and how we can be praying for you this week. If you are visiting or a first-time guest with us today, I hope you had a chance to stop at the guest tent on the way in where you would have met a member of our team and you'd have been given a gift. And inside that gift, there is a guest card. If you'd be willing to scan that QR code and fill it out, or you could fill it out with a pen and paper and put it in the offering boxes in the back, uh, we would like a member of our team to reach out to you this week and continue to welcome you. Uh, live stream, so glad that you're with us. I wish you were here so your voice could be multiplied with ours, but I understand sometimes that doesn't work, especially on a weekend like this that's a holiday weekend, uh, but I'm so glad you're joining us online to worship with us. And um, if you are new or newer to us, you can text get info to 94000 and a member of our team will reach out to you as well. And if you are someone who's newer, newer, or maybe you just haven't been to one of our Consider meetings before, we're going to be having those next week after our Saturday service and during our 1015 service. And our Consider meeting is really an informal place for you to have a chance to get, know, uh, get to know us a little bit more, how we came to be, what kind of ministry and how we do ministry here, how you can get involved, or simply just ask some questions of our leaders um, and get those answered. So you can register for that online or on the app. If you have kids, they can stay in our kids' ministry area. Our team would love to serve you in that way. And if you've been to a Consider meeting, you know that here at Christ Church, we pursue Jesus and growth in Jesus through what we call the rhythms of life. And we highlighted studies and groups a couple of weeks ago. And today I wanted to highlight serving on teams because it's equally important to our discipleship to be able to set ourselves aside and to serve. And our teams are a place where we can obey God's call to glorify him by using our lives and our gifts to help others know and love Jesus. And uh, we have a lot of places we can serve here. You may be wondering, well, that's great. I wanna get involved, but I don't know how I'm gifted. And my encouragement to you would be don't overthink it. There's a lot of great reasons to serve and not very many bad reasons to serve. We may serve because we are extremely gifted in an area. We might serve because we love serving in that way, or we might serve simply because the church needs it and we want our lives to be useful for the kingdom. Um, regardless of what team you're on, our ministry leaders work hard to make sure all of our teams are a place where you can have fun, you can serve in community, but more importantly, you can step in each and every week to fruitful ministry. And like I said, there's a lot of places you can serve. I do wanna highlight two of them because they do such a wonderful job of letting us do this and letting us worship distraction-free every week. And that's our kids' ministry team and our Connect team out there. Um, I wanna highlight them for a couple of reasons. One is simply because I like full disclosure and I'm a guy of full disclosure and we need people. Uh, but more importantly, I wanna highlight them because they have some big teams that love doing what they're doing and they can quickly get you connected, get you up to speed and get you using your life to serve Jesus here at Christ Church. 
Um, so whether it's in one of those areas or somewhere else, if you're ready to get involved or maybe you just know it's time to be ready to get involved, you can go to the Christchurch app and go on the dashboard and fill out the serving interest form. You can do that online as well uh, or after the service, I'll be at the hub right out through these double doors and I'd love to get you connected as well. Lastly today, we do have the opportunity to worship God through giving. Um, and I say opportunity and, and I mean it even more this week because I was reading in the Old Testament and seeing what giving was like then. Not that God intended it to this, be this way, but if you look at the people who are participating in it, it is worship and it is obedience, but there is a legalistic and formulaic nature to it. Um, and I just feel privileged to be able to give as new covenant people who still give out of worship and we still give out of obedience, but we get to give out of love and gratitude and expectant hope that we will be able to see what God has done before, we'll be able to see him do it again. So whether you gave online throughout the week or you're bringing your offerings to the boxes in the back, let's pray and dedicate those to the Lord. Father, we are here as new covenant people, uh, people who have been gifted with eyes to see and faith to pursue you and live in the peace that is found only in you. Uh, and Father, I pray that you continue to work in our lives and soften our hearts to give us the ability to pursue that quiet humility and sacrificial service that you've called us to. Uh, and Father, we bring our gifts before you today and we ask you to multiply them. We ask you to use them for your kingdom and for your glory, to bless people the way that you've blessed us. Um, and specifically today, we pray that you would use our lives and our gifts to shine spiritual light into those living in darkness, uh, and also for those among us or your people throughout the world whose faith has grown weary or complacent or lukewarm or even cold. Uh, we pray that you would use our lives and our gifts to reignite the fire of faith in them. We pray this knowing that you are the all-powerful God who can, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
about the character of God, particularly his faithfulness. He will not, cannot fail. He won't. We can trust him. There's peace in that. I'll rest to listen in your promises. My confidence to who he is is your faithfulness. Yeah, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Oh, I will rest in your promises.
Lord Jesus, you are worthy. You're worthy of every song that we've sung, of every life represented here in this room. What a privilege to be gathered together, to rejoice in your holiness, and to declare together through songs your worthiness of our worship. It's a miracle. It's not how we were born. It's not what we would have discovered on our own it is not the finished product of our good works. It is not because we have been wise enough to figure it out. It's not because we are good enough to be your children. It's because of your grace. Enemies by birth, rebels against your glory. You sought us, you found us, you saved us. And you brought us together here this morning to rejoice in the finished work of your son and our savior. Oh Jesus, may it be obvious that we are your people as we sing these songs and give our offerings and engage with your word. May it be obvious that the Holy Spirit is present here in us and among us. Spirit of God, continue your work. Where refreshing is needed, please refresh. Where revival is needed, would you revive? Where renewal is needed, would you renew? Where restoration is our desperation, would you restore? Where repentance is needed, would you lead us there by your loving kindness? Help us to understand the Bible. Help it to shape and mold us to look more like Jesus as Jesus' people. And Spirit of God, would you take the word and draw those that are not followers of Jesus to Christ this morning? We pray these things, believing they're what you've designed and desire for this time. So we pray them attaching your character to them, Lord Jesus. We pray them in Jesus' name. If you can agree with that prayer, can you say amen? Amen. amen. You can be seated. Well, welcome to Christ Church. So glad that you are here this morning. Church family, it's good to see you. Thank you for making this a priority in your week to gather together and to worship Christ with your church family. Uh, I hope that you have every sense that this is your church family. Uh, somebody stopped me in the lobby just after the first service and uh, was encouraging me with how God's word has been working in their life. And I was able to encourage that person that I know exactly where they sit. And uh, I'm so thankful for you, church family, and uh, our gatherings together and how God uses them in my own life. And I do pray constantly that God would use these as starting points for a week as a church family that would glorify him in whatever circumstances are on the table for us as individual followers of Christ. Guests, thank you for coming as well. My name's Adam, and I serve as lead pastor here. We're really thankful you came. I don't know what circumstances brought you. I don't know who you came with or how you came, uh, what condition you're in, but we've been praying for you. We've been praying for you that God would meet you here and that if you know him, he would encourage your faith 
And uh, if you don't, that you would meet uh, the Lord Jesus, who we follow and we worship uh, through your time here with us today. That's what we've been asking God to do. And I uh, trust that you've already been encouraged through uh, your visit so far. Those who are joining in on live stream, welcome to you as well. Add my welcome to uh, Sean's a moment ago. And uh, if you're part of our family and out for the weekend, happy Labor Day weekend to you. Hope that you will be back with us soon. And if you're a guest kicking the tires on uh, live stream, we're thankful for that. And we trust that'll lead you to being with us here. There's something very special about the way the Lord works when we meet together. And uh, that is his intention. It's obvious throughout the Bible. So if you're visiting this way, we hope you'll visit in this room very soon, if that's at all possible. Thank you for being a part of this with us today. Whether you're a guest or whether you're online or whether you're a part of the fam here in the room, let's all get our Bibles and open them up to John chapter 14. Guests, we don't take ourselves seriously here at Christ Church, but we do take God's word very seriously uh, because we do follow the Christ who is the worthy one. So if you would join us in opening up a Bible to John 14, that'd be great. If you didn't bring one, we've got one for you to borrow. Should be one underneath of a seat nearby that uh, you can use. If you see somebody, church family, if you see somebody looking for one, you better be... Johnny on the spot with that black hardback copy of the Bible. You'd be passing those down. You'd be getting those to people. And uh, if you're new to the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospel records. And uh, they are easy to find in the second half of the Bible. But if you're brand new, that's fine. There's a table of contents in the front. Go to the Gospel of John. There's a page number there. And join us at big number 14. And uh, you will be with us. And I really would encourage you to do that uh, today so that we are all on the same page as we study Uh, God's word. We're making our way line by line, paragraph by paragraph through John's gospel. And uh, this series, which has taken quite a bit of time, but it has been great time, is called Life in His Name because this entire book of the Bible was written not first to give a chronological historical record of the life and ministry of Jesus, though it does accomplish that in some ways. This was written as an argument. Seven signs that proved or validated the messianic claim of Jesus that he is the Messiah were recorded by the Apostle John, who was one of the closest friends of Jesus during his earthly ministry. Uh, Discourses that surrounded those signs are provided. uh, That's preaching and conversations and interactions that Jesus has. And all of it was written so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the Savior for our souls. And he is the one and only eternally existent second person of a triune Godhead. He is the son of God, uncreated one who took on human flesh, dwelt among us, tempted in every way like us, never sinning as we have always sinned so that he might pay a full penalty for our sin at his cross. And he rose victorious from the grave to conquer sin and death. And here's what John says. In the end of writing all of this down, he says, so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ and he's the son of God. And in believing, you might have life in his name. That is the intention. So Christians, believers, it is for us to believe freshly, to be convinced more for the week to come in every paragraph of our study. And for unbelievers, for non-followers of Jesus, for you to be convinced that Jesus is the only savior for your soul. He is the Messiah. He is the one who God the Father sent as his only son to take your place and mine and to pay our penalty in full and to provide eternal life for us all. So we are praying that life in his name would be the experience, those of us who follow him more so this week than last, and for those who have never met him for the first time in the week to come. Now we're marching our way through John 14, which is a pretty specific little section because John 14, remember, is in the upper room. The record that John is using here is just hours before Jesus died on the cross. He's with 11 of his 12 disciples because his 12th disciple, Judas Iscariot, has been dismissed from the room and is carrying out his betraying plan to turn Jesus over to the authorities who will crucify him. And having dismissed Judas, he told the 11 that he would be leaving them. Peter spoke up and said, wherever you're going, I'm going. And he said, you can't come with me, Peter, yet. You will be there eventually, but not now. And as the reality of the absence of Jesus from his disciples, physical presence, as his absence starts to set in on them, it troubles their hearts 
and it is expressed in their faces looking back at Jesus. And he begins in John 14 to address those disciples who are so troubled. He gives them truth. He delivers to them all that they need to have an untroubled, settled soul, to have certainty in the life that they're gonna live on the mission without him physically here. So what they had yet to experience, what we have always experienced, is being informed, our faith is being informed by the words of John 14. So pretty important for us in this next week as we live on the mission of Christ as his people, as his followers. So today we come to verses 18 through 24. And as I was thinking about this, I I just wanna leave this with you to get started. The power of a promise has everything to do with the record of the promiser, right? The power of a promise, I got one amen back there. (laughs) The power of a promise has everything to do with the record of the promiser. Listen, the impact of somebody's promise on you has everything to do with what you think the likelihood is of them coming through on the promise, right? I was thinking about this, and here's a 2022 American smartphone tethered illustration. We use Yelp. How many Yelp users in the room? We use Yelp, okay? Yelp is a back-checking on the promise of restaurants to provide you with good food in a clean environment with good service. Their commercials make it look like it's gonna be great. The pictures in the window look phenomenal. But Yelp will tell you whether you should believe the promise that they're telling you. And I've done my fair share as a part of humanity of reviewing to help bring clarity to the record of the promisers that it has failed me. Loved ones, as followers of Jesus Christ, Our relationship to his promises is essential for us to live with certainty and boldness on the mission to lead others to him and to walk as his disciples on this earth. And it ought to be such that the promises of Jesus have the most impact on us because the record of the promiser is 100% faithfulness to every promise. He has never failed. Every promise is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So this morning, we get the opportunity to have Jesus bringing promises to the disciples with their panicked eyes from their troubled hearts in the upper room. He delivers promise after promise after promise to grant them a certainty. So if you're taking down notes, we're gonna call this standing on the promises. The record of the promise maker is 100% faithful. And in fact, as we study it this morning together, these promises have been fulfilled. And as John recorded them, that's the apostle John, who was one of the 11 who was in the upper room. Late in the first century, as he writes them, they were all fulfilled as he wrote them back down. Think of his memory as he's writing them down. Remembering what Jesus promised and how faithful he had fulfilled his words. Certainty is intended for us as we stand on the promises. Let's read them together, okay? These are God's words for us. John chapter 14, verses 18 through 24 this morning. Let's give it our full attention as we study. Jesus is recorded here by John as saying in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not as scary, said to him, Lord, How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and we'll make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's 
who sent me. These are God's words for us this morning. May the Spirit of God help us now to get them and to be gotten by them. Here's a big idea. If you're jotting down some notes, and I hope you will, put them in your note app, do whatever you gotta do. It'll help you to engage in the study and to review later in the week. Here's the big idea. Very simple. Christian certainty, that is certainty on the mission. Christian certainty stands on the promise keeping Christ. The power of the promise is directly linked to the record of the promiser. Christian certainty, our boldness, our certain purpose in this coming week to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the the 11, their certainty and ours is linked directly to our promise keeping Christ. It is in our confidence in him to fulfill his promises that we find certainty to live on the mission for his agenda. So the question then is, well, what promises have been kept? And let me tell you, if you wanna go through the scriptures and see all of the promises that have already been fulfilled, that have already been kept, some of them are directly kept in your life right now. It would take us days to go through all those promises and what a great few days it would be. But for this morning, there are four promises that are kept right in this paragraph. So I'm only dealing with four out of many, many, many promises that have been faithfully kept so that our certainty would rest in our promise keeping, will stand on the promise keeping Christ. So four of them, you can jot them down, I'm gonna give them to you this way. These are promises kept for my certainty. So promise number one that is kept for our certainty, I'm gonna blast through the first three and then we're gonna sit a little bit in the fourth one. The first one is he said we would see, we are seeing. So even as John writes these words in verses 18 and 19, John is remembering the reality of the faithfulness of Jesus. Jesus made a promise in that upper room. Their panicked eyes looking at him with their troubled hearts, knowing that he was gonna leave them physically, he delivered promise, 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 and he was faithful to fulfill all of them. The first one's in verses 18 and 19. He says, I will not leave you as orphans, and the as orphans there is so important. That's what they had on their faces looking back at Jesus. You're abandoning us? We're gonna be without you? You're gonna leave us on our own? That, that orphan language is such a potent and powerful picture. Left without the resources, left to our own resources, left without the people who have been providing for us. Like, you're gonna leave? I will not leave you as orphans. And then he follows with the promise, I will come to you. And as soon as he says that, we've got to, as Bible students to ask some questions, don't we? Does he mean I will come to you as in when the, when the second coming happens, when Jesus comes back for all of us? Does he mean I will come to you metaphorically through the spirits and dwelling work and all the people of Jesus Christ? Or does he mean very narrowly the post-resurrection appearance to the 11 disciples and the 500 other disciples who had the privilege of seeing him after his resurrection before his ascension to the right hand of the Father? And if we go to verse 19, we find the answer in the clues that are given to us there. Verse 19 says, yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Now listen to me. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he comes on the clouds with all of the saints of all time, the world is gonna see him. It's gonna be obvious. And when he so cleanly and so precisely says that they will see him, he's using very literal language. So it seems that the best understanding is not metaphorical. This is actually the promise that in just a few days from the upper room, right before he's crucified, three days later, he's resurrected. In just a few days, they will actually see him. The world won't. There's no public display, no public ministry. He doesn't hold any post-resurrection revival meetings, none of it. He goes to his people. He talks to his disciples. He engages with them. Those that are not his disciples become his disciples. That's the only people he interacts with. All of it to fulfill his promise that they will see him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse five and six remind us that the disciples saw him, the 11, and the 500 
or so also saw him after his resurrection. So you say, well, if, if they saw him and that is faithfulness to his promise, he kept it, then what does it mean that we are seeing? Listen to me, listen to me. Second Peter chapter one and verse 19 is important because though we do not see him face to face yet, First Peter, or Second Peter rather, chapter one and verse 19, the apostle Peter, who's one of the 11, who's one of the first people who got the fulfillment of the promise to see him after his resurrection, tells the, the readers and the spirit of God tells us that even though Peter was a eyewitness to the glory of Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, even though Peter was an eyewitness to the glory of Jesus Christ in his resurrection, faithfulness to his promise, we have a more sure prophetic word than their eyewitness testimony. It's right here. It's in the inspired scriptures. Listen, the apostolic word given to us, which reveals to us the son of God in all of his glory. The inscripturated word reveals to us the incarnate word so that we might be the people of the word, followers of Jesus and people who see him through eyes of faith. 2 Corinthians chapter three and verse 18 says that though we see him veiled yet, we are being changed by our sight. We see him and seeing his glory, we are changed from glory to glory to glory. We're becoming more like him the more we stare at him with eyes of faith. Colossians chapter three, verses one and two tell us to set our eyes on things above. We are told in Matthew chapter 15, that we are no longer to be considered amongst the blind, but as those who are seeing. Jesus said, we would see. And the 11 saw, and through the 11, we all see. Not yet as we will, but we see. First John chapter three, verses two and three says that we do not yet see him face to face, but when we do, everything will be made right and we will be like him. Jesus is faithful to his promises. The record of the promiser should have a direct correlation to the power of the promise. So for our certainty, John records the promises of the upper room that were kept. I mean, this has been a crazy monsoon season, has it not? I mean, I'm a 10-year Arizonan at this point. This is the craziest, longest, most torrential monsoon season that I can remember. And, uh, I don't know. My, my mom is here visiting from out of town. And she said, now, how long does the monsoon last, honey? I said, I have no idea. I don't know. It just keeps going and going. Here's the thing. My children have picked up a trait from my wife. They, they like lightning. Okay, I do not like lightning. I run away from lightning. My wife tries to find the lightning. And my kids are in the same way now. In fact, when we were early, when we were first married, first few years of our married life, we were living in Texas. This wild storm's going on. My wife is on the back porch, people. She's on the back porch. And she yells in the house, honey, you gotta come see this. Babe, you gotta come see this. She didn't call me honey. Babe, you gotta come see this. So I'm, I wanna be the husband that my wife thinks, I'm glad he's my husband. So I, I go out there against all my better judgment. And I'm gonna tell you what happened. First thing is, I heard the lightning. Have you ever heard lightning? I'm not talking about thunder. I'm talking about I heard the lightning. I smelled the lightning. I'm not kidding. I smelled it. And the thunder boom that happened after you hear and smell it is something that'll make you do things that you regret. My wife was thrilled and I was hiding somewhere in the bathroom immediately after. My kids are the same way. Man, they love the lightning. And in this monsoon season, it has been awesome. We're in the car driving and they just constantly are going, did you see that? Did you see that? And they describe it. Oh, it's a big one with like all these different arms coming. Oh, did you see that one? And I'm just a little annoyed. No, I'm trying to look at the road, people. I'm trying to get us home safe and sound. Don't you love your dad who's a responsible adult? is isn't into lightning. The apostles saw. And under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they just keep saying, do you see? Do you see? Do you see? They wrote it down. Do you see? Do you see who he is? Do you see who he is? He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. We see. Through eyes of faith, now. 
but he is faithful to his promise. So we walk with certainty into this next season of our lives, full of faith in his promises with future fulfillment. That's the first one that he's kept. Here's number two. Number two, he said we would live and we're living. It's the end of verse 19. There's that one little sentence is there. If you got your Bible open there, check it out. He said we would live and we're living. He said, because I live. As he looks at those disciples, he says, because I live, you will live. You will live. And that is a bigger statement than you think. It's not like you'll live till tomorrow. It's not that you'll live through this hard season. It's not that at all. He's saying you will live eternally. You will live spiritually. You will be alive. Having been born like all of us, dead spiritually in our sin, no vital signs, Jesus promises that because he lives in resurrection life after he has died, we also live. We live because he lives. Romans chapter six, verses six through 11, the apostle Paul tells the Roman church that though they are crucified with Christ, he takes them to the cross with him, paying their penalty for their sin. If they are crucified with Christ, they are also raised with Christ. Romans six, six to 11. Galatians chapter two and verse 20, the life that we now live, we live in Christ. He promised the disciples who were so troubled at the thought of his physical absence from them, He promised them that they would see him and they see him. And he promised them that they would live in him and we live in him. We are alive. I don't know the last time you thought about being alive. That's a rare thing. I don't know the last time somebody asked you if you are alive. I had that happen to me when I was in college. It was the year 2000, Y2K, a lot of extra goods that year. Anyway, I was in a car accident, and uh, I tried to get out of the car that was so mangled. I'd been, I hit somebody, and then I'd gone off and got hit head-on the other direction. And I was trying to get out of the compact car that I was in at six foot five. And as I turned and tried to push the door open, I couldn't get the door to open. And then I felt this immediate like surge of pain up my spine, and I got really scared. So I put my head back, and I closed my eyes, and I just thought, don't move your head, don't move your head. And the girl that I had hit ran up to the window, which was out, and she yelled in the window, like right here, I think he's dead. (laughs) And I moved my head. And I said, I'm not dead. She's like, he's not dead. Here's the reality. Wherever life is, there is evidence of life. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, with certainty in his promises because of his faithfulness to keep them, ought to be able to remember when we were not alive and now how we are alive. We ought to be able to know what spiritual deadness looked like in our lives, though we may not have the precise moment in time where the made alive Lazarus story was ours come out of the tomb, but it happened, and there's evidence now that we are alive. How did the girl know that I was alive? Because I turned and looked at her and said, I'm alive. There was evidence. And the beautiful reality of Jesus' words was known by the 11 after his resurrection and has been known for every generation of his people. He said we would live because he lives and we are alive. We were born dead in our trespasses and sins, but he made us alive together with Christ. We're alive. He's good on his word. He's faithful to his word. Be bold this week as his people on his mission. Listen, we talk about growing together as our theme for the year. Growing up spiritually together means that we're just alive together. We're alive together. We're in various parts of development. Different aspects of our lives are mature and immature. Different fruits are being born in our life that are the marks of Jesus Christ and maybe somebody else who has different fruits that are showing Jesus Christ, but we're growing up alive, living together because Jesus is faithful to his promises and Christian certainty stands on the promise keeping Christ. So that's the second one. Here's the third one. He said we would know and we know. He said we would know, we're knowing. Now we get to verse 20. And Jesus says to them, 
in that day, when the resurrection has happened, when all of it is clicking together, you will know that I'm in my Father and you in me and I in you. In other words, what he says is everything theologically is gonna come together. I'm in my Father, the Father's in me. There's an inseparable unity between the Father and the Son, distinction in person, but inseparable unity in character and essence. I'm in the Father and the Father's in me and you're gonna know it. Because when I come back to life, it's gonna be obvious to you, but he goes beyond just knowing, us knowing that he's in the Father and the Father's in him, that there's an inseparable unity between the Father and the Son through the ministry of the Spirit in us. It's not just that, it's that we will know that we are in him and he in us. In other words, what he says here is there will be an experiential knowledge that is delivered. He promises the 12 or the 11 whose eyes are showing the trouble of their hearts as they look at him. He promises them. He makes a promise. In that day when it all comes together, you will know that I was telling you the truth. I am the son of God and you will know that you are with me in an inseparable unity. John chapter 17 is gonna unpack this so much more in his high priestly prayer. In verses 20 to 23, it is the inseparable unity of the body of Christ with Christ himself that is the privilege of the people of promise. He said we would know, and we're knowing the inseparable union with God. Do you know God? Do you know him relationally? That's because Jesus said that would happen. He's faithful to his promise. I mean, I'm a parent, so, you know, something that I know very well is hearing, I know, Dad. Oh, that is a hard thing to hear. I know, Dad. And I, there's a way that they can say it where I just say, I don't think you do. If they just quickly go like, I know, Dad. It, mm, no, I don't think you do. <laughs> Having my mom here is hard. It's like generational, you know? My mom, like, dealt with this, and then she would say, when you're a parent, honey, you will understand. I'm here to also say my mom has been faithful to her word, and yes, absolutely, as a parent, I understand. But my kids can also say things in a way that definitely relays experiential impact. If I say something to my kids and they say, I know, I know, dad, right? That's what they say now, right? I know, right? That is an experiential tone. It's that what I'm saying to them, they've actually experienced it too. That's what Jesus is promising. It's not an intellectual assent, like I know things, that the Son of God and the Father God are inseparably unified in their character and essence. I understand it. I know it robotically. No, this is the knowledge that I'm in him and he's in me and he's in the Father and the Father's in him and the Spirit's in me and dwelling me as the helper and I have a relationship with God. I know, right? I know because he said I would know. He promised the disciples they would know. The 11 and every generation since, and we are knowing. He's good on his word. Live with certainty on his mission this week. Last one, number four. Promise kept for our certainty, number four. He said we would belong we are belonging. He said we would belong, and we are belonging. These are powerful words that Jesus uses now in verses 21 through 24, and they're significant for us because they come in layers. There's a layered effect to the belonging that's delivered to us here. And I don't know if you're prone to think you don't belong. Perhaps you even feel like that right now, sitting here like, I don't think I belong. These, I don't belong in this environment. If that is your tendency and a personality trait, it's likely that's bled into your discipleship as well. And what Jesus promises these troubled heart 11 disciples who are facing the reality that his physical presence is about to leave and what is gonna happen then? We're gonna be on our own. It's gonna be up to us. We don't fit in. We don't belong. We're not, we don't have any relationship to God apart from you. And he says, you're gonna absolutely belong. I'll show it to you. He says in verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him or her and manifest myself to him or to her. Whoever, the 11 plus all of us, 
for all the generations, has his commandments, keeps them. That is the evidence that they love him and the evidence that they love him further confirms that they are loved by the father and they're loved by the son. And the son will manifest himself in them through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the first layer of belonging is you are loved. You are loved. I don't know if you've heard that phrase recently, but you are loved. You are loved by a father with an inseparable love. He could not love you more in the week to come than he does right now. And he could not love you less in the week to come than he does right now. That's because your position with him is not earned. It's not based on merit. It's not based on works. It is based on his love for you through the finished work of his son for you and your trust in his son. That's it. He loves you with the same love that he loves his own son. Because the father's in the son, the son's in the father, and I'm in the son, and the son's in me. You are loved. Now, right here, as soon as we read those verses about whoever has my commandments and keeps them, that's the one who loves me. We are tempted toward error. It's been this way for all of God's work through the new covenant era. In fact, I wanna give you two passages to make that obvious that there's a problem sitting at the door when we hear those words. So jot these passages down. Galatians chapter two, verse 15 and 16 is the first one. Galatians 2, 15 and 16, the apostle Paul wrote it to the church at Galatia. In 15 and 16, he reminds the church that their justification, their position with God being declared righteous when they are unrighteous has nothing to do with works. It has everything to do with their faith and faith alone in Jesus. So you might be tempted, as were the Galatians, to think that you've got to work your way up into loving God and therefore God loving you. You got to prove it and then he loves you. And as long as you you do enough to prove, oh, no, I really do. Then he's like, okay, I believe you this year. I love you. Galatians 2 is in the Bible for you. It is through faith in the finished merit, the earning, the good works of Jesus Christ that we are declared righteous. He takes our penalty on himself, and through faith, he transfers his righteousness to our account, and we are declared right with God. So one error is to read this and to think, I better get going on doing stuff of obedience so that I can prove that I love him so that the father will love me. But there's a second error. It's James chapter two, verses 14 through 26. James two, verses 14 through 26, face the opposite error. James was writing to Jewish people who had been liberated from the law through the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But those people were tempted to think that faith had no consequence. There was no outworking of faith. Faith never turned into something. It never produced anything. And so in James 2, verses 14 through 26, James says, show me your faith and I'll show you my faith by my works. And he says, faith without works is dead. It's of no value. So listen, loved ones, when we read these verses, and he's gonna come back to this thought before we're done. Obedience to Christ is the evidence that he's loved us and we love him. He first loved us and we love him. Our position is secured by his grace through faith in his son. And our progress of obedience developing in us is the evidence of our faith. Faith that doesn't produce anything is dead. And that's terrifying in the culture in which we live. Where people want to claim to belong with no evidence that they love or that they are loved by God. The evidence is always obedience, not perfection but the direction of our lives is altered by our relationship to God. And don't forget the paragraphs we just studied, verse 12, just up the page, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Belief in him results in love for him, which is always manifested in obedience to him. It is not that we obey into loving him, it's that we love him, so we obey him. But to claim that you love him without the evidence of obedience is to make a claim of belonging that doesn't hold water according to Jesus's words in the upper room 
with his 11 disciples. So first layer, you are loved. Second layer, let's look back at it now in verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot. <laughs> I, sometimes I'm weird about things. I think like Judas was in the room while John was writing it down. And he's like, Judas, were you the one that said to him? Uh, and, he, and he's like, yeah, but can you put in there not Iscariot? Just make sure nobody's confused. Got it. Judas, not Iscariot. He's known in church history as Jude Thaddeus. If you read the other uh, listing of the disciples, he's Thaddeus. That's who he is. Jude Thaddeus, or Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So he's still hung up. He's trying to process all of this. And Jesus does not rebuke him like he did Philip or Peter. He just answers him with a reiteration. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He'll keep obeying my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. So first level of manifestation without the world is the manifestation post-resurrection. Second level is that the father and the son will make their home in every true follower of Jesus. And the word home is the same word as make a place, prepare a place for you in verse two. We will come and make our home. How? Through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, God will dwell in his people. The second layer of our belonging is fellowship. We have fellowship and communion with the Father and with the Son through the presence, power, and ministry of the Spirit in us as the people of Christ. Listen, loved ones, when Jesus is saying these words, it's intended to give certainty to a very uncertain group of dudes. They are very uncertain. You're leaving? Yes. And here's some promises you can take to the bank. You will see, and they saw, and we see. And you will live, and they lived. All the way to their martyrdom, they lived. And all the way through death, they live. And we are living. And you will know, and they knew. And we are knowing. And you will belong, you will be loved, you will have fellowship, and you will be an obeying people. Look at the last part. He finishes by saying it negatively. Whoever does not love me, does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. So you just don't get to not keep my words. You're rejecting the Father himself. You and I are promised belonging through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And he has been faithful to keep his promise. We are loved. We do have fellowship with God. And we are a people who are progressing in our obedience as the direction, as the pattern of our lives. I mean, this is so out of sorts with the cultural understanding. So many now are saying that you can belong before you believe. That's ridiculous. You cannot belong in the family of God apart from belief in the Son of God, which results in love for the Son of God, which produces obedience to the Son of God, which is further evidence that you are loved by the Father in the first place. Jesus is faithful. Certainty spiritually, even in whatever circumstances produce uncertainty in you. Certainty is our privilege because we're with Jesus, okay? And he's faithful to his word. Christian certainty stands on the promise keeping Christ. All right, we learn in order to live here, so jot these down and take them home. Number one, promises unknown hold no benefit. If you don't know the promises, there's no benefit in the promise for your personal life. Let me just start by saying, if you didn't know that the Bible promises you as a sinful human being, just as you are at this very moment with all of your sin, with all of your guilt that's piled up with your holy creator, if you don't know that the Bible promises you just the way you are, if you will turn from your sin or any other way to make it right and place your faith in Jesus alone, and call out to him for salvation, if you don't know it, the Bible promises that if you do that in faith, you will be rescued, period. Every story, every background, every culture, every ethnicity, every tribe and tongue and nation is the way the Bible speaks of it. All of us, we are not the good people, we are the ones who have found the promise to be true. The promise you're here to hear is the one that Jesus delivers that all who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting, eternal life. 
promises unknown hold no benefit. Church family, promises unknown hold no benefit. It is not enough to know that your Bible's full of promises. You must engage with the promises. They're everywhere. May they bolster your confidence and provide certainty this coming week for you. Friend, if you don't know Christ, take him at his word. Cry out for salvation and he will save you today. Number two, promises disbelieved hold no power. Perhaps the cry of your heart this morning needs to be, help my unbelief. Believer, I believe, help my unbelief. Things are not connecting. The Spirit of God is faithful. Wait on him. Soak in the promises. Run to the word and know that he will, he will connect the dots again. He's faithful. Number three, promises untold hold no hope. We're here as the promise relayers in this coming week. We have the promises which produce hope in us and we are living amongst the people with no hope because they do not have the promises. You're in that workplace, you're in that family, you're in that sphere of influence that God has entrusted to you so that you would relay the promises. And the promises untold, they bring no hope to those who desperately need the hope. Standing on the promises of Christ has been a certainty producing pattern for Christians of all the generations. In fact, there's one Christian who was particularly impacted by this. His name was Russell Carter. He was a professor at Pennsylvania Military Academy in 1886. He was 37 years old. He was a fascinating guy. He was a professor of multiple disciplines. He actually wrote textbooks, but his most important writing was that he sat down and he penned a poem that is the old hymn standing on the promises. Maybe you grew up with that as I did. Here's what Russell wrote. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, By the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I now can see perfect, present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I shall not fall, listening every moment to the spirit's call, resting in my savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Christian certainty stands on the promise-keeping Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your book. Thank you for this conversation in the upper room. Spirit, thank you for answering our prayers for help. I pray now that you would do with the word whatever is needed so that we are not merely hearers but doers of your word. For the most uncertain of us as disciples, would you sure up our certainty. For our friends that do not know Christ, would you draw them to him? For those that have been walking in your promises, would you affirm, confirm, and further stabilize them for greater influence on the mission in the coming week? May we be a people standing on the promises that you have delivered to us And may we be a people marked by our awareness of the promises fulfilled in the cross of Christ. Even now, as we take the bread and the cup, would you remind us that this was prophesied hundreds of times in hundreds of years prior, all fulfilled, culminating in the cross that brought us salvation. You are faithful. May we be bold this week as we walk trusting you. Jesus, be exalted now among us through the bread and the cup. We pray it in your name, amen. Well, we're gonna finish by taking communion together. If you're a follower of Jesus in faith, 
Uh, even if this isn't your church home, we would welcome you to take this with us, join us in this. If you're not follower of Jesus by faith, if you're not trusting him, you don't believe, would you just let this happen around you? If you're wrestling with that, just let this take place. Uh, we're gonna move around in a minute. We're totally comfortable with you not participating and we're so happy you're here. But this isn't making anybody okay with God. This isn't cleaning us up so if something bad happens today, we got a better shot at heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. This is a symbolic, spiritual reminder of the cost that was paid for us to be sons and daughters of God. So if you have just placed your faith in Christ even today, join us in remembering and celebrating through these symbols what it costs for you to be a child of God. If you're not yet there, would you consider Christ as this happens around you? He is your only hope of salvation. Church family, don't mock the cross. The warnings are significant and severe in 1 Corinthians 11. The cross broke the power of sin. If we're living in unrepentant patterns of sin, let's confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and let's allow the bread and the cup to be our seal toward obedience in the week to come. The cross unified us. It made us a family when we weren't a family. So if there's disunity in this room amongst the believers, Let's take care of that before we take the bread and the cup. Maybe we need to lean over and have a little conversation. Maybe we need to send the text toward peace. But let's not mock the cross by taking it in disunity when the price paid unified us as a people. There's two cups here. Thanks, Andrew. Top one has the juice and the bottom one has the bread. You're gonna take both of them. Leave your section by row on the left and come back on the right, hang on to these. We're gonna reflect on the gospel, repent where needed. We're repenting people. And then I'm gonna lead us in a moment. We're gonna rejoice together in taking this as a church family. So there's a human station in front of you. Come, Joshua's gonna sing over us. Team's gonna sing truth. You can sing as you come. And I'll lead us in taking it in just a moment. Light of the world, you step down into dark. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore Hope of a life spent with you Oh, here I am to worship Here I am to
the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed in the same upper room where we've been studying his words in John 14. He took bread as a part of the meal with his disciples. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread, he passed it to the men, and he assigned a new significance for every generation of his people that would come. He said, this is my body, which is for you. The body that was torn, abused. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember his body given for our salvation. The same way also he took the cup after supper. It's one of the final elements of the meal. And this was the cup that had long been the reminder of God's promise for redemption in Israel. Jesus assigned this new significance. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the long awaited new covenant where hearts are changed, where the spirit indwells and where the Jews and Gentiles are brought in together through faith in the finished work of the son of God. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember his blood shed for our salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Paul says, for as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. I love that. It's like we're yelling across the room that the cross was enough. It was sufficient for us to be saved until he comes. We're not at a funeral. King's alive. He's coming back. And we are his people through the finished work of his cross and his glorious resurrection. Let's stand together and let's rejoice in our privilege to stand on the promises. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. that be more than just a song to finish our time. May that be the story of our week. Whatever God brings, whatever is on us and coming at us, whatever it is, may we be a people who are standing on the promises because of our faithful promise keeping Christ. It's been sweet to be together today. Church family, thank you again for being here. Hope it's a great Labor Day weekend for you. Guests, thank you for being with us as well. If you've got questions on your heart about Christ, about what it means to be a Christian, what is all of this? Who are these people and who are they worshiping? Would you let us serve you before you leave? You can stop out at the hub. It's the rugged area in the middle of the lobby. Our team is there with name tags on. They would love to meet you. You don't need to talk to one of our pastors. We'd love to do that. We'll connect you to one before you leave. If you've got questions about our church, they can get you the answers there. Um, if you skip the tent and you didn't get the gift, here's the thing, I love you, you're my people. Just go to the, the hub and say, I skipped the tent, I don't wanna talk, I just want the gift. <laughs> and we'll give you the gift, we want you to have it. We totally get you, and we're so glad you came. Church family, hey, if you need to get involved in serving here, and that's many of us, if it's been merely taking but not giving, that's not the way of our discipleship. So stop at the hub too. They can help you get connected or go on the app. Let's get, let's get going on some teams. Let's, let's start flooding these teams. I think kids and connect teams are the ones that we talked about today. Those need people, but we, we need to be serving as a part of our discipleship. That's why we really want this to be a part of our lives. So you can stop at the hub if you have questions about that as well, okay? Prayer team is here in the front. Guests and church family alike, we love to pray for you, pray over you, pray for grace 
for you to stand on the promises, okay? We've gathered in his name, we scatter in his name. Go with this truth on your life, church family. You are loved. Have a great week for Jesus Christ.